I'm just going to ask you to look at me and ignore that and just speak conversationally. Okay? Great. First thing, can you start off by telling me your name, your name where Jack. you live, and what you do? Uh, Jack McNary. I live in Dallas, and I work for a biblically-based counseling ministry called Hope for the Heart. And we have uh, two radio programs, a 15-minute teacher-student on the daytime, and then a two-hour live call-in talk show at night from 11 to 1 Central Time. And we have an 800 number, and people call from all over the United States. And uh, the founder of the organization takes her situation and presents God's picture from the Bible, or biblical truth. Kind of our byline is God's truth for today's problems. It's a fascinating place. You uh, have a one eight hundred number. You have a website. Oh, we do. It's hopefortheheart.org, and our uh, eight hundred number is one eight hundred four eight eight H O P E. So how long have you been doing that? Uh, I've been there seven years, and the ministry's been. Uh, I think it's. 16 years old. Is that um, part of your educational background or is that something you just... No, it's like a lot of things. It just one thing after another that doesn't relate to anything before it. So what kind of stuff did you do before? Just kind of a little history of you. Um, I started out uh, in high school racing motorcycles. And then uh, when I graduated from college, I started a pool cleaning business. And... Um, then uh, we had a retail store and a service and construction company. And then I uh, started a wholesale distribution company, swimming pool equipment in several states. And then a um, publishing company, Creative Media. And we did road shows and different things across the United States, some with the National Swimming Pool Institute and some with Jacuzzi Brothers Pool and Spa Equipment and so forth. And then I sold that company and worked for um, Another ministry in Dallas, Evantel, for a two-year period. And then I started a catering business, and then uh, I um, went to work at Hope for the Heart. So you weren't kidding about all around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, can you tell me if you have any uh, political affiliation, any strong beliefs? Oh, well, I'm a Republican. And, um, you know, I pretty much take their stance on just about everything. You know, at least I have in the last few elections. You weren't as much a Republican before that, or did things change? No, I probably wasn't interested before that. You know, I probably got interested in politics. When I married my wife, I married way over my head. And so that brought a lot of... Uh, things into focus that needed to be that weren't before politics and voting was one of them. And so um, I would say the last maybe 25, 30 years. We've been married 31. So. I've been alive 31. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you, can you tell me what uh, you thought of President Kennedy at the time he was president? But that was before I married my wife, so I really wasn't too interested in politics. I mean, I thought it was neat that the president was coming to town, but I wasn't really tied up in the Bay of Pigs and just all the stuff that was going on. I was racing motorcycles, and that carried a lot more importance than who was president of the United States, in my mind. So uh, what made you come down here that day, or what made you come to the route that day? Uh, well, the president was going to be here. And I thought it might be a legitimate excuse to cut school. And so um, some of us came, we had a motorcycle then, and some of us came down on our motorcycles just to see the parade. But we realized that it was so crowded downtown that, you know, it was going to be, be a zoo. You wouldn't be able to see him. So we went down the freeway and pulled off at the exit to uh, Market Hall and kind of just parked there thinking that as he took, turned off the freeway, you know, we'd get to see him and wave at him and so forth. And can you tell me what you remember of that day and what happened? Uh, when we got down there, the, uh, they came by, but they were going real fast. And they had these uh, guys on the back of the car with guns and everything. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of a 
unfriendly way. All these people came out to see the president. They zoom by and you don't get to wave or anything. And then this guy came up and ran up behind me and jumped on my motorcycle and startled me. And he had a card that said he was with the paper. And he said, the president's been shot. Take me to the hospital. And I said, what? He said, quick, the president's been shot. Take me to Parkland. So we were there by the railroad tracks, and just going down the railroad tracks was a, kind of an easy way to get there. Not easy, but it was quick and direct. And so we came up at that time, Parkland wasn't anything like it is now, and we just came up the back side on the motorcycle up through the grass into the parking lot. And as we got there, uh, they had him on a stretcher, a gurney, and were taking him into uh, the hospital. And of course, a reporter and the people that were there, there weren't very many people there. I would say other than the hospital staff, there may be one or two people. And then when they took him in on the gurney, well, everybody went, went in and it was just me standing out there by the car. And um, so it was uh, pretty messy. And it was quite a while before uh, anyone else showed up. Because, you know, they had to get through traffic and all that, I guess. And so, uh, I was standing around and just kind of looking at it and um, the back seat, it was real plush leather and the back seat had a lot of blood in it and some flowers were floating in the blood. And I wished I'd had a camera, but I didn't. And then on the right hand side of the car and the back of the front seat, uh, it looked like uh, overdone scrambled eggs just scattered along the door in the seat and I'm assuming that was his brains. And uh, so I was just looking around at everything, wishing I had a camera or I could, you know, had something as a souvenir to remember that day. And uh, one of the men came out and uh, the car was a convertible, it looked like, but it really had a plastic top about two inches thick and they were, those panels were kept in gray felt bags in the trunk. So he came out and I helped, I don't know if he was Secret Service or whoever, but I helped him take the, cut, the panels out of the car and out of the bags and place them together, which made just one solid bubble on the car. Then they had a Naga hide cover that came out that snapped in place. And when that was in place, it looked like a hard top with roll up windows but actually it was just one solid bulletproof top uh, with this uh, outline of the, that made it look like it was a hard top with rolled up windows. After we got that done, people started showing up and they put a line up uh, and we had to all stand behind that. Um, did he just ask you to help him put that on? I don't know that he asked or not. Uh, I don't think there was much interchange when he opened the trunk, I was just there and started helping him unzip them, and they were pretty heavy. And so uh, he didn't discourage the help. And I think two people were so caught up in what's going on, they were just doing their thing, whatever that might be, and not really talking about it, still in shock. And uh, who was that reporter who had come up to you? I don't know. I don't know who that was. Uh, I was working at the Times Herald at the time. But I don't think he was from the Herald. He might have been. But uh, in fact, I don't even remember what he looks like because he jumped on the back, turned his thing around, I glanced at him, and then went to Parkland. And I was thinking about getting up the hill without falling down or something. And then the minute he, we stopped, he got off and ran off. So how long did you hang around there after you helped put the top on the car? Did you do anything else? No. Once they made us stand behind the lines, a friend of mine, an attorney, has uh, he had a lot of interest in the Kennedy assassination, and he has some books, uh, and in a couple of them, uh, there's my picture standing right against the line. Uh, but once the, once the activity started and people came, they shut down everything, and we had to get quite a ways back. So that was, that was pretty much it. So tell me about your job at the newspaper then. I worked in the complaint department, and I also threw a downtown paper route. That's how you have to race motorcycles because you can't win enough to do it, so you have to have another job. And uh, a funny thing about that is um, the day that Oswald was shot, 
uh, it was the day I threw my paper out. Well, the police station was on my paper route, and I had an old 55 Ford convertible with cherry bomb mufflers and lakes pipes on it, and I thought it was so cool to go down through the bowels of the police department in low gear and just rack off the pipes because they'd echo. And, and uh, so when I went down there, I you know did my normal thing, thinking it was so cool. And then I got in the back and threw the bundles of papers out at the exact door where Oswald came through later. And from the time I left there to the time I drove to the Times Herald, which is just a few blocks, Ruby had shot Oswald in that exact spot, which was kind of uh, unusual. And I thought, golly, this is amazing all that's going on. I thought, wonder if it's ever going to stop. And, uh, and they talked about a lot of security. I, I kind of don't agree with that unless a lot of security meant as they opened the door and the people in the photograph stepped out because I wouldn't have been able to rack my pipes off in the basement of the police department and go down in a 55 Ford convertible making all kinds of racket if there had been any security. So maybe when they say there's a lot of security, they meant walking down the hall with Oswald, but there was no one on the doors or on the street or anything. Um, I guess I should have asked you before, but when you saw the president's car, what besides that you wanted to have a camera on you, what, what through your mind did you think that he was dead? Well, I wasn't sure what brains looked like, but I felt like that they looked like scrambled eggs because I heard my dad, who was a rancher, and when he was growing up and they would go out and do roundups and all kind of stuff and they talked about eating different parts of the cows and they would mix the brains with the eggs and scramble them and he said I was curious about what that tasted like and looked like and he said you couldn't tell the difference. So from that I assumed that what I saw that looked like scrambled eggs well done was his brains. Uh, when I worked at the Times Herald, uh, they had a, a department upstairs where they did the the typesetting, and they had these old machines that would melt lead, and these guys would sit under these really big black machines in a really dirty environment, it's like a smelter or something, and they had one light bulb hanging down on a wire, and they'd sit there and do the linotype, and when they would type it, it would make the letters from the molten metal, and then they'd box them. And, move them down and they'd print from it. They took a lot of the plates and everything and put them over on a table and then they recycle everything. So I was talking to the guy about it and uh, asked him about those plates, if I could have some of them. He said, yeah, because they were just going to destroy them and recycle them. So I went over and picked some of them out. And uh, working at the Herald, I also got a bundle of the papers uh, for the days that went on there for a while. A lot of the papers have deteriorated and everything over the years, but um, those were the plates that we talked about that they used to imprint uh, the papers back then. That technology's gone, that paper's gone, I mean everything about that is uh, past history. So what plates do you have? Are they the headlines? From those no, they're or? photographs. Photographs of different uh, you know, just different things from the paper on the 23rd. Not realizing uh, how quick it was they recycled that stuff, I went up the next day at work to go and get some more and had already uh, done away with them. So. You said earlier something about you had just been in this building recently for the first time. That's true. We had a, a man came down from uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis to Dallas. Um, a donor to our ministry, and uh, he was a real, had his old these theories about the Kennedy thing and had all these questions and wanted to come down here. And I said, well, you know, I've never gone. My wife has said it, they did a great job on the museum and how well it's laid out in the building and so forth. So I brought him down here and we had lunch at the Record Grill just to set the stage. And then uh, we came to the museum and that was in April of uh, this year. And that was the first time I've been here. And why did you not come before? Um, tell you the truth, I don't know. Just, I guess, lack of interest, too busy, you know. 
life is so daily. It's what happens while you're making other plans. And I never just had, when I had time off, I did something else with it. And I only had this time off because the gentleman from Minneapolis came down. And he was quite a character. He wanted to get his picture taken on the X out in front of the building. And so I'm trying to get his picture without both of us getting run over. And he still talks about his trip to Dallas. <laughs> and so what did you think of the museum once you went through it? I thought it was great. I thought it was really good. I love the way they did the building to set it up, the way they did the window display. Um, I thought the old original window that they have up there was kind of neat too. I mean, it just shows you kind of goes back in time. 40 years is a long time and so many things change. And even the fence that they have up there now by the grassy knoll uh, is a one before plank. The fence back then was one that was more typical to that time where they would take a, or a tree limb or something and split it so that the backs would be flat but the front would be rounded and then they would lash those together. So the type of fencing that was used is isn't even the same. But I, I think they did a great job on the museum and I would encourage everyone to come here and see it, especially because it has an unbiased approach to the assassination. I mean, they let you draw your own conclusions from the material that they present. And uh, I think they've done a very good job. Have, did you ever go over to the Kennedy Memorial? Uh, I've been over there twice, just kind of looking around. Once I had to pay a traffic ticket or something, or parking ticket and had some time and or jury duty maybe but just kind of walked around what did you think of that well i don't know i think it's something that they erected in his memory which is uh okay but i think the museum does a lot more for me than that you know it's kind of like a memorial or a tombstone or something and this you can really kind of experience it with the sounds and the smell of the old building and you know the things that you see and the pictures from the past building up to and after the fact uh, so this meant a lot more to me than the memorial so looking back now being more politically aware and probably more historically aware what do you see as Kenneth Kennedy's place in history well, I think, uh, I think he did a lot of things for our country. Um, one thing is kind of down the food chain, but he got everybody involved in athletics, in school system. I mean, PE took on a whole new focal point. And I think you can see how now then, the people that started there um, have had a, a lot of athletic involvement bicycling and so forth. Of course, now that they're getting older, when they fall off their bicycle, they break things and get, have other problems. But uh, I think that's a major thing that he did that was very positive. Um, politically speaking, you know, I don't really have an opinion. Uh, I think that he made some mistakes. I think he was really pushing the envelope uh, in a lot of areas, but I think that uh, he lacked a lot of character in some important places, and I think that really came around to keep him from being what all he could be for America. It takes a steady hand to hold a full cup. So, so how would you rate him in comparison to other presidents you're familiar with? Well, I think that my favorite president uh, so far uh, is uh, George Bush, and uh, I, I like what he stands for. I like that he speaks his mind. I like that from what I understand in our organization, Hope for the Heart, we go to a lot of national religious Christian broadcasting meetings, and the president spoke at our last one. And uh, I feel that he really is a man of God. Uh, everyone that is around him says that uh, he starts every day with prayer before he goes to the war room. Uh, I think that he has very strong convictions um, and he's going to do what he says. And uh, that's encouraging and refreshing. And uh, the president prior to that was uh, 
invited to come to our uh, national convention, which every president since Nixon had, and refused. And in the, uh, other episodes that took place during his presidency, he wasn't asked again. So uh, um, I'm really behind uh, George W. Bush and what he does. And I think he tries to do the right thing. And I think his character uh, is such that he's not going to fall into the same snares that some of the others have. Any other opinions about, strong opinions about presidents that you remember? No, not really. I like Jimmy Carter and a lot of the things that he did, but he just didn't seem to have, um, oh, I don't know, a, a lot of, um, he was tenacious, but he just didn't seem to have a big picture of how it went on. You know, there's some people that are actors, and they've never been in a play. But when they walk on the stage, they get it. I think he was good, but I don't think he really got it. And the actors that get it really get it. Peter O'Toole, we were watching a movie for him not too long ago. And he really gets it. Uh, and, and, and I think that Jimmy was just a little, I don't think he quite got it all. Speaking as a Dallasite, did you ever experience any negative feelings about Dallas? And about well, response to Dallas because of what happened? Uh, during the summer when I would race motorcycles, um, it was all over the United States, so you're in a lot of places, and you got a lot of negative uh, comments, and you know people, you know, like I was in on it somehow, and uh, they didn't really want to know what I thought or where I was that day or went on, what went on. They just wanted to tell me how bad Texans were, and everything for killing the president. And I got uh, hooked up with a Harley Davidson dealer in Albuquerque. And uh, so I just signed up from Albuquerque after that, so that you yeah, just didn't have to listen to it. Because they didn't really want you to discuss it with them. They just wanted you to let them lambast you and go on about it. Well, if you're from Albuquerque, I mean, so. Um, so what things do you think helped improve Dallas's image for, over time? Uh, time, time changes everything. You know, you go to Elvis's home and all of his suits, his waist about this big. Well, you know, his leg might have been that big towards the end, but it wasn't his waist. So time changes everything. And um, I don't know that we can, I mean, you can do the monument, you can do different things to try to change public image, but I think time's what's really going to do it. Just right after that, being uh, for the next year or so, being in different people groups, uh, they didn't know about our monument. TV wasn't what it is today. They had an opinion. They gleaned that from an article or somebody, and I don't think you were going to change their mind. I could be wrong. And I only talked to people that came to motorcycle races, so that's kind of limiting the population. So, <laughs> But that's just kind of where I was at the time. Now, I watched the movie and I saw on the television some of the things that were going on, but uh, I never came down to see it. Um, what did you think of the movie? I, I thought it was pretty good. Um, I liked the, the, the part about it that took place in New Orleans and all that. I mean, that was just, you know, um, who was it that painted him? It was painted all gold and all the homosexual stuff. I mean, you know, to me, that was part of his movie. But it just didn't, I mean, it didn't tie into me what it, to, I thought it was interesting. And, but uh, it's a movie, you know, I'd rather go see a John Wayne movie, really. <laughs> so can you tell me what you think of the conspiracy talk? Well, you know, uh, there's a lot of different opinions and a lot of different groups involved. and. 
all that I know is what I saw. And what I saw was the car before and as we put the top on it. And if you put the president where he was sitting and you put the brains where I saw him, he had to have been shot from the back in my mind. Because if he had been shot in the front, it would have blown everything on the back. And when Mrs. Kennedy is going back and they say she's going back to pick up the skull, uh, I don't think that's true. It was a black car. It was in the sun. It was hot. So whatever landed on that would have stuck. And when she crawled back, it would have smeared. And there would have been scrambled eggs going back. There would have been scrambled eggs on the back of the seat. The only thing that I remember seeing in the seat was the blood in the bottom and the brains on the right side and on the back of the seat in front of it. So to me, he was shot from the back and that the skull was stuck in the skin so that kept it wherever it was and the bullet went straight through. Now I don't know how the bullet navigated its way around the car and did all this magical stuff. I don't know. But it seems to me like that the way the car was turning to the left before it went down and turned to the right, he would have been turned a little bit to the left the guy on this building right over here where they found a 30 out 6 shell could have put one right between, right above his ear, blown the things forward, the brains and so forth. So me, I'm leaning towards this building over here because it's kind of in a straight line with the X. They did find a shell up there. Now maybe the guy was, I don't know. But it seemed to me like that would be where the bullet would need to come from in order to do what I saw. Because on the back of that trunk deck, there was nothing. And if it had stuck there on a black paint job at that temperature, driving down the freeway, driving it off, the guy with the machine gun back there would have smeared it or it would have back, it was perfectly clean. And nobody came out and cleaned it up because I was there by myself. So that's my conspiracy theory. So I, I don't know. Uh, all the other, the manhole cover and all that, I don't know. I think Oswald was so obvious and so easy to spot that he was a setup. And I've only drawn that conclusion from what I know that day and from going through the museum. I was taking what I saw and what they listed as a place, because when we were talking, Denny and I, the gentleman from Minneapolis, before we went in, I said, you know, the car coming down here, it's the first time I'd ever even really thought it out. I just, if the car come back here, it looks like the guy would have to be somewhere else. Then when we saw where they found the shell up there, makes me think somebody was under that sign, because you wouldn't be looking for him. But so many people could see the window open and the box and the gun sticking out for all of them. Now there's supposed to be somebody in this building over here in the shadows and so forth. And I don't know, it could be. But I think Oswald was set up. I think he would probably be pretty easy to set up. And um, that's just my take on it. So do you have any feeling about who would that be behind it? Not really. I mean, you know, you can, I think Oliver Stone did a good idea of collecting a lot of information and trying to weave it all into a movie that would sell tickets. And so, you know, you can have different people thinking the mafia and just on and on and on and on. I think it is interesting that the route was changed when it was changed and everybody was in position. So somebody knew it was going to be changed before they maybe change the motorcade, I don't know. But I think to have people where they were at that point in time after the change was either really lucky or it was um, by design. No, because I, um, 
No, I really can't. I'd hate to speculate. And you know, I really wasn't into all that back then. You know, I was more interested in Gary Nixon, Bart Markle, and George Roeder, who are almost all dead now, but they were the greatest motorcycle racers at that part in time in America, and that's who I was interested in. I do. What makes you sure about that? Uh, I, because there's so many loose ends. Uh, and young guys like you doing things like this just keeps it before the public. The fact that the museum is um, uh, done in such a tasteful way, uh, it allows for change so people can come back and forth. They're adding things, uh, documentaries, films. I think it's going to be a mystery that. Uh, for another 60 years till they open the time capsule, nobody's going to know. And really, I don't know that I'd believe what it said then anyway. Because uh, the people that could be hurt by it will all be dead. And the people that could argue against it are going to be dead. So whoever put the time capsule together is going to create the way you'll think 100 years from now. Right or wrong, it's like Elvis. Elvis didn't fit in a 28-inch waist anymore, but all of his clothes at his museum show he's a 28-inch waist. So everybody's going to think, gosh, the king was never fat and slobby like he was. Wrong. So when we open it, I don't know that it would gain anything. Because I thought, gosh, it's a shame I won't be around when it opens it. And I thought, why would I believe what I saw anyway? So, But I think the way that this has been done, and I think the... The fact that Kennedy was killed here, then you had the movie Dallas. Uh, I think Dallas is on the map. When you go to foreign countries, they want to know two things, one about Kennedy and one about Dallas. And when you show them South Fork, they can't believe it. Such a letdown. So, you know, it's the movies. But I think there's enough confusion, enough unknown about Kennedy that uh, there'll be people here all the time. On the weekends, it's packed down here. And there are a lot of younger people that are, you know, in it. And people like you doing documentaries and Stones movies and so forth. I think it's going to be, uh, have a high level of interest for years to come. Uh, one other thing on this area as a downside, are you aware at all of G.B. Dewey? Uh, well, uh, this is his plaza down here. And uh, he started the Dallas Morning News, I believe. And uh, I went to high school with one of his grandkids. And uh, I had a morning route. And um, I think that's pretty much it. What grandkid did you go to high school? Uh, Eddie Ossaker. And, uh, and he had two other brothers, Kelly, and then he had an older brother. I've forgotten, Jimmy. The Oscar boys. Did you bring examples of the pictures that you have? Uh, I brought uh, a paper from that day with the, the pictures, and then I had I made some copies uh, on a Xerox machine with of the plates, but the copies don't look very good. Okay. Um, well, before we look at that, is there anything else that you wanted to add that I've neglected to ask? No, uh, I think we covered. Uh, it all happened really quick. Uh, over that period of two or three days between Kennedy and Oswald. And uh, I think it really put a knot in everybody's stomach from Dallas because they never dreamed, one, that this would happen, two, that it would happen in our town. And I think that uh, a lot of people grieved over that, whatever their political position was, just because the President of the United States could be killed here. And. Um, I, I think that's one thing that really hovered over, um, I know in our school it did. Um, I think that's one thing that people will always remember is how sad that was uh, to have happened here. We never dreamed it would happen. You know, we would think maybe New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. or someplace, but not here. I mean, this is just Dallas.
Do you think you want to say something, Jamie, or? <laughs> Those are, those are the these are the these are the whoa these are the plates or the picture it, it, it didn't turn out well these are the Dallas police holding their guns up and then these are some people that were at the Parkland Hospital that were crying after the you know when the okay those I are think all the I think these are in this paper these papers are so old now. Yeah, see, there's... Maybe you could sit down and just kind of talk about it. Uh, okay, about the... It's kind of hard. You mean to hold it up? We don't necessarily have to. I mean, you just kind of hold it and just talk about it, like, what plays you have. And well, this is, um, of course, the pictures from the Dallas Times Herald on November the 23rd and uh, some of the plates that I have here I don't know if you can see them in this light but are the people that are grieving and uh, the um, I have one of this um, the priest Reverend Oscar Herber who describes the death scene and I think that's I think that's pretty much I have some others that um, are different ones in this. I don't see the it must be in another paper, the one where all the policemen are holding the uh, I was holding their guns up and looking up to the roof. And then um, this was the picture of Oswald being shot. I don't have that plate, but that was where I dropped off the newspapers uh, at the police station. And then uh, I'm not sure what's in this one. I haven't opened this stuff in years, to be honest with you. In fact, these were just three papers there that I... Uh, had in storage that I went by to get. I think this is just uh, just briefly looking through here. I don't see any of the any other pictures. And this was on like the twenty second. This was the day of the late edition, so they didn't really have a lot of the uh, stuff out there then. But we. Uh, what we uh, are thinking about doing is uh, getting with the museum and donating them to the museum so that they can put them up on display and, and uh, use them in that capacity because uh, that technology's gone. Uh, the building, I mean, everything to do with that was gone, so there'll be no more plates. Now you can make pictures from pictures now with the technology we have, but to reproduce those pictures again, you'd need those plates, which was, you know, I was fortunate to be there to be able to, to get them. Yeah, if I could ever get any footage of those plates, it would be helpful to you know, intercut them with what you're saying about them. Uh, there, you can see, I, I'm not sure how you'd go about doing that because um, I basically just try to video tape a you know a pan of them that I could mix in there with what you're saying um, okay we'll see what we can uh, uh, do I wanted to talk to the gentleman here at the museum Max uh, to see if they had uh, someone that could you know talk about them or praise them see what they if they'd even want them you know, if, if somebody wants them, uh, they're priceless. If they don't want them, they're absolutely worthless. So, um, it, uh, you know, I wanted to, and then we were near, I left my number a couple of times and then I was out of town on conventions and things, so that didn't, we never hooked up. But. Well, before we go 
going to Stephen, is there anything else now that you thought of since we looked at this? Anything else you want to say before I stop this? No, um, uh, I can't think of anything. You know, when you look at security now, I mean, when you leave your home and you're going to fly to San Antonio, you're constantly reminded of security. Back then, you could drive your hot rod through the basement of the police station and not even get a ticket. So, so many things have changed in the world. And I think this was one of those pivotal things that started that change. Because I think that's the first time, if it was a conspiracy, uh, where a foreign country had had a major impact on our shores. You know, you read about World War II and this and that, but it was never here. This was the first time Oswald, Russia, whatever, I don't know how it all came about, but it had an impact here. And then you went from this to 911. And so I think we were so naive and so wet behind the ears that we never dreamed. Our imagination was such that we couldn't fathom something like this would happen. So what would we need to do to prevent it? And now then, security and terrorism and being attacked in your own home is kind of getting to be a way of life. And I, to me, this was maybe, maybe it's because I just live here, but one of the most significant switches that was flipped about thinking America is in a position to be hit. That's it. Okay. I appreciate it. It's very interesting. Let me get this off with you. Well, I'll just drop this down no, the back of your shirt. It's much easier to pull there. stumbled into my wife and her sisters down here on the street. I mean, don't you think that's all right? Mm -hmm. It is amazing, although there are other things that I missed, like I came down here the day after Kevin Costner's got by the plaza. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I, you know, I didn't miss <laughs> Well, thank you for letting us uh, of use your room.